And uh, yeah, I would like to start with a brief introduction to phase fit models in general. So the first introduction in, fra in fracture mechanics was for brittle fracture. And the main idea is that instead of dealing with, uh, with sharp crack topologies, as we are uh, used to in fracture mechanics, uh, this, the crack is smeared over a domain. And to this end, we need to do, introduce a damage variable or a phase fit variable taking values in between 0 and 1, where 0 denotes an intact material state and 1 denotes a fully broken material state, and together with the so-called length scale parameter L, which denotes the, um, or which determines the amount of regularization that is the width over which the uh, crack is near. If you want to extend uh, this approach now to uh, describe ductile fracture, and if we try to do this by just uh, combining a a brittle a phase field model with an elastic plastic material law, then it is most likely that we will get some unphysical results due to the fact that there are completely different uh, fracture mechanisms. So for brittle fracture we have debonding of atomic planes, whereas for uh, ductile fracture we have initiation, growth and coalescence of voids due to evolution of plastic strains. So the biggest problem that arises in this case now is that obviously in the elastic phase field model there will be no influence of the uh, plastic strain rate in the damage evolution. And a little bit combined to that, we have uh, some other issues. That is, uh, if we uh, look at uh, damage evolution under tension and compression loadings, they can be almost equal. And generally speaking, a simple phase field model for brittle fracture uh, cannot uh, deal with uh, cyclic loading conditions. On the other hand, if we take continuum damage mechanics, we know that this is an adequate uh, framework for dealing with, uh, with ductile materials and fracture. And in particular, uh, gradient damage models have basically the same mathematical structure as uh, phase field models. And that is what we try to do now here. We want to propose a phase field model in the context of continuum damage mechanics. And we want to do this uh, furthermore in a thermodynamically consistent manner. So after this introduction, I will talk a little bit about the thermodynamical framework and then uh, present the main features of the model together with some numerical investigations and of course, in the end, there's the conclusion and an outlook. So the problem with thermodynamics in this case is that we have uh, non-local effects introduced by the gradient of the damage variable in the phase heat model. And classical thermodynamics are a local theory, which means that it is basically not applicable for this case. There are some other um, approaches in the literature, but we want to propose a new one for dealing with this problem, and that is uh, the uh, framework of so-called non-conventional thermodynamics. And the basic idea of this framework is that besides the classical heat flux vector, we introduce a so-called energy flux vector, which represents the influences of the non-local effects. And by introducing this, we can obtain basically the same uh, form of the second law of thermodynamics as we're used to in the classical case, besides one additional term, that is this divergence term of the energy flux uh, vector. And besides that, this classical procedure in thermodynamics and the model proposed later is in accordance with its uh, second laws. So we uh, established the model in that way that the second law is always fulfilled um, during loading. If you move over now to the model, it looks as follows. We have essentially the additive decomposition of the strain tensor in an elastic and a plastic part. Uh, we have a free energy density that consists of an elastic plastic parts depending on the set of internal strains, which I don't want to uh, dig further into for the sake of time. And also there's an influence of the damage variable. And the influence of the damage variable is uh, captured by so-called degradation function. In the phase field context, this is uh, usually taken as a quadratic function of the damage variable. And we have a term uh, that um, denotes energy stored in the material due to damage evolution. And this is the classical uh, phase field approach. So this term, uh, this approach here, is used also in the elastic or in the brittle uh, fracture mechanics case. And we have um, the, the theory of the fracture toughness, as it's known in. Uh, in brittle fracture, of course, for ductile fracture, this will have a different interpretation, but the same, uh, the same purpose. Together with the length scale parameter I introduced earlier, and we can see here the non-local effect of the non-local part, this is the gradient of the damage variable. 
We further have a yield condition, that is in our case a simple Farnesis yield condition with a Cauchy stress tensor sigma, back stress tensor C, uh, isotopic variable, isotopic hardening variable R, and uh, the initial yield stress K. And again, we need to introduce damage effects uh, to our yield condition, and we do this by the same, by introducing the same degradation function as before. A special feature about this model here is that the uh, initial yield stress is decomposed in two parts, in an energetic and a dissipative part, where the energetic part contributes to the energy stored in the material. I don't want to dive further into this, um, but this is based on some physical evidence um, when trying to model, it, to model proper, the, properly the uh, energy stored in the material. And of course we have, as usual, an associated momentum rule. And finally, we have uh, the evolution equations for the hardening variables, that is for the isotropic hardening, again with uh, damage influences in terms of the degradation function. And for the kinematic hardening, we assume one backstress tensor on Armstrong Frederick model, as it is known, where S dot denotes the rate of the plastic arc link. And last but not least, the special thing we want to talk here about is the damage evolution equation, which is very usual and common in damage mechanics, but not in the phase field context. So we have uh, damage evolution coupled to the evolution of plastic strains, which was one of the problems we mentioned earlier. Uh, we have further material parameters Q and M, and we have a constitutive function B, which captures the stress state, that is the function of uh, stress flexibility and load angle. And omega is the thermodynamic driving force, which again takes a form that is very common in the phase field community, let's say. And in particular, we can recover here from this recorded records that I forgot to mention that damage evolution will also um, occur only if the thermodynamic driving force is positive, which basically recovers the uh, elastic case of the uh, damaged material. So, with this model attempt, I want to move over to the numerical investigation and some words to the finite element in implementation. So, in the finite element context, the phase field variable is introduced as an additional degree of freedom in the model. We perform a staggered algorithm, that is, we uh, solve basically two independent problems. In the first step, we have a constant phase field variable and solve a pure displacement field problem. And in the second step, the displacement is held constant and we solve a pure phase field problem. And in the particular case here, we have for the second, for the phase field problem, uh, two um, degrees of freedom actually that we are solving for. Because if we move one slide back, uh, the introduction of this Macaulay bracket here uh, poses some numerical difficulties when trying to derive a weak form of this, uh, of this equation here, which is why the driving force omega is introduced as an additional degree of freedom itself in the model. And if we come now to some numerical investigations, uh, the material parameters are taken for structural steel S355. And the first problem I want to talk about is one that is seen very often in phase field works. That is an edge crack plate, and we impose uh, displacement boundary conditions on the upper boundary. And we impose in particular cycl cyclic loading conditions with a positive mean value. And this is just an introductory example to show that the initially mentioned problems are covered now in this case. So on the left side, you can see the predicted crack after 15 load cycles. And here on the right side, you can see the damage evolution at the node at the crack tip. And what you can see in particular is that, first of all, damage evolution occurs only during the tensile parts of the loading phases. But during the compressive parts, um, this, uh, the damage variable remains constant. And in particular, we have uh, damage evolution in each cycle, which was again a problem that cyclic uh, loading conditions could not be recovered. And at some point, the damage variable reaches the value of 1 and the crack uh, propagates. One thing I want to mention here is that for the uh, stress state function B, uh, we assumed here a very simple uh, function that is only uh, a cut of value in the negative traxality ranges of below minus one third. But generally speaking, the triaxiality function that is assumed here can have a very big influence on the predicted track path. 
because if you look at uh, the example, at the same geometry, but now if you impose a shear deformation, the monotonic shear deformation on the top boundary, and if we don't assume a function for B at all, that is, we take the value of identically of 1, then uh, a straight crack basically is, uh, is predicted by the model. Whereas for the same function I mentioned before, uh, with the negative cutoff value in the traceality, uh, a slight kink in the crack is predicted. And if we take a more sophisticated function that incorporates the load angle as well, uh, as mentioned by Mr. Manche, who I suppose is, or who I believe is one of the authors of the next presentation, and uh, this, this function was further developed by some other authors, we see that a completely different angle uh, will be predicted, or is predicted. So generally speaking, the assumed function for B has a very big influence on the uh, predicted break paths. And the last example I want to talk about is some numerical, uh, some experimental uh, comparison. So a former colleague of mine performed uh, fatigue tests on thin wall tubes with this uh, cut holes in there. So the tracks can be seen here on the left and on the right side. And he actually captured the strain fields around the crack tips by digital image correlation. And so we want to compare these strain fields. And for that purpose, I modeled, we modeled uh, a small part around the crack tip uh, for a crack uh, that has already a length of 2.4 millimeters. The reason is that this length is obtained after 9,000 loading cycles, which are, to be honest, impossible to resolve at this point with this model. So the, uh, the purpose was to compare the, uh, the strain fields in a damaged state. So what we did was to apply five loading cycles on this model here so that the damage value, the damage variable at the correct tip obtained a value of just one at the end of these five loading cycles. And comparing now these, um, these two results, we have in the back, in the colored contour plots, the digital, digital image correlation uh, results, and in the grayscale ISO lines, we can see the uh, results from the numerical analysis. And generally speaking, I would say the results agree right very well uh, for this case. And with this, I want to come to a conclusion. So we presented a phase field model for ductile materials in the context of continuum damage mechanics. We used in particular the framework of non-conventional thermodynamics uh, to uh, show the, or to prove the thermodynamical consistency of the model. And we saw the numerical evaluations that, in particular, we mentioned issues in the beginning of the presentation are recovered. And that in the case of the experimental comparison, we have a very good agreement. And for further work, for future work, of course, uh, the next step is to determine parameters specifically for materials and uh, specimen, and to then proceed to uh, more complex track paths in, uh, with, for example, uh, non-proportional or mixed mode or and mixed mode uh, loading conditions. Thank you very much for your attention. And thank you very much to you. We have time for questions, yes. Uh, first, congratulations for the work. Very elegant, very interesting. Uh, please, in the damage evolution law, you have two material constants. Yes. I believe B and Q, or Q yes. and M. Yes, yes. How, how do you uh, calibrate these material parameters based on which tests? Okay, it's, it's one doubt that I have. Yeah. And, and in the following question is, uh, it's, it's a very elegant uh, methodology uh, to compute damage evolution, but, but how do you compare it in terms of computational cost, efficiency, uh, which case it performs, be performs better than a traditional fracture mechanics approach. What's the advantage of it comparing with a traditional fracture mechanics? Thank you very much. So I'll start with the first question. Uh, so these uh, two material parameters, M and Q, basically determine the speed, let's say, uh, with which uh, the damage accumulates. So uh, to calibrate, we can perform either monotonic or cyclic uh, experiments, for example, on a compact tension specimen, and compare the uh, crack propagation speed, for example, or to compare the crack length after a, a certain number of, of uh, loading cycles with the uh, predicted uh, crack length, 
let's say. So basically, the, the damage, the speed under which damage accumulates needs to match the experimental uh, results. Okay. And for the second question, well, the problem, the uh, model uh, which is here now, is computationally not efficient, to be honest. It's uh, recently proposed, so there is much uh, room for uh, computational uh, efficiency um, improvements. Uh, but, uh, or for example, uh, this is actually one of the next topics to tackle as well. Um, if we want to calculate a higher number of uh, loading cycles, what one can do is uh, to extend it by so-called extrapolation methods, where we don't calculate every each and every load cycle, but extrapolate uh, the uh, internal variables after a certain number of load cycles, which are assumed uh, that the variables remain constant after this number. So this is one possibility to extend the model further for more, more efficiency. And generally speaking, for placid models, uh, the big benefit over uh, um, traditional uh, fracture mechanics models is that uh, difficult uh, phenomena like crack kinking, uh, branching, and so on, are covered without taking into account any further uh, assumptions. So the idea is that the crack finds itself uh, its way through the material. Okay. And wh what about the characteristic length L? This is assumed generally in uh, gradient models to be a uh, material parameter. So, so you choose it yourself? Not part of it is related to some internal uh, distances. For example, this can be the microscopic distance between voids, for example, or the, the uh, size of voids. Um, it is not. Or more pragmatically, the element size. Right? It's not a, a numerical parameter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know, I know. But some numericists <laughs> use it. Yeah. As, well, it's a numerical just... fitting parameter, or say, okay, I want. Such a finite element with yeah. such a size, so I will think. No, it, well. it should not be a numerical yeah. fitting parameter. Okay. No. So you choose it yeah. ba ba uh, based on uh, physical considerations. Yes, yes. Okay. Any no. short question? Yeah. Yes? Uh, maybe. Oh. Uh, one uh, question uh, regarding uh, the, the, the plasticity model. It's a local model, right? It's a? It's a local model, so there's no gradient in the... Yes, the yes, it's a local model. So, would it be also possible to extend it also? To yes, yes, of course. Model? So, the plasticity part and the damage part are pretty much uh, independent from another, besides the point that damage evolution is coupled to the plastic strain rate. But this is the accumulated plastic strain rate, so it's independent of how it is accumulated, so one can take also a gradient plasticity model, of course, yes. Okay, it's time. Uh, hi. Short question, short answer. Okay. Uh, just a short question. How have you treated the irreversibility condition? Which approach have you used to tackle the irreversibility? Actually, this is the point where the Macaulay brackets uh, come into the game because otherwise this uh, omega can uh, have negative values. Uh -huh. But by requiring that damage accumulation happens only when omega is uh, positive, it is recovered by that. Ah, okay. Okay, let's so let's